It is the knowledge that I'm going to die that creates the focus that I bring to being alive. The urgency of accomplishment, the need to express love now, not later. If we live forever, why ever even get out of bed in the morning? Because you always have tomorrow. On my tombstone, I want the epitaph, be ashamed to die until you have scored some victory for humanity. You want to make a difference in the world. If, if, if you don't want to make a difference in the world, go move to another planet. I mean, why, what are you here for? And a victory for humanity is not a victory for yourself. It's not statues, it's not your name. It's just humanity's better off. That doesn't mean people praising you. That that's, no, not even about that. But what do you have to give? with no expectation of return. No one ever told me that I had to search for meaning in life to begin with. So that was never even a part of me. It was, I got my life, this is who and what I am, this is what I did in school, these are my dreams, ambitions. How do I create meaning in my life as I go forward? My first question of me wasn't, where do I find meaning? It was, how do I create meaning? And that started early that many people look for meaning in life, as though it's gonna be under a rock or behind a tree. You have more power than that. You have the power to create meaning in your life, rather than passively look for it. So for me, I create the meaning. People who are always saying you won't amount to anything, People who are saying, maybe your loved ones or your family, saying that you're the greatest, all right? So both are bad if they're not representative of a reality that will ultimately matter to you as you go forward. So I think your own assessments are become important. Make your own measurements. And the gym instructor pointed to my father online and said, Cyril Tyson, everyone look at him. He does not have the body type that would excel in track and he says what no one is going to tell me what i can't do in my life and he used that as a reason to start running within a few years of that he became world class at one time had the fifth fastest time in the world they were competing against the new york athletic club and his best friend johnny johnson was coming around the final straightaway and a runner from the New York Athletic Club is a few paces behind him. And Johnny Johnson overhears that runner's coach say, catch that. And he overheard this. And so what did he say to himself? He said, this is one he ain't gonna catch. <laughs> and that extended his, his, his lead to the finish line. And he tells this story not with any bitter tone as you might think. It was, here's an occasion to parlay what today might be called a microaggression into a reason to excel even more than you had expected of your own abilities and talents. When I grew up, it was very common to hear the phrase, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You recited this. This was an inoculation against hate speech, really, against just evil people, just nasty people. I can say from the era in which I grew up, I don't give a rat's ass what you say to me, okay? Um, unless you are between me and some goal, then I ha I'll have to navigate that some way. I was athletic in high school and college. I wrestled, by the way. There was another guy on the team who was my weight. He was a senior, talented fellow, majoring in economics. He said, well, what was it you're majoring in again? I said, well, physics. And he says, well, and you want to do what with that? I said, I want to uh, get a PhD in astrophysics. He turns to me and said, astrophysics? Then he says the following. The black community cannot afford the luxury of someone with your intellect to spend it on that subject. And I was devastated by that comment. And I knew my interest in the universe 
was real because I felt it in my heart. I felt it coursing through my veins. But my responsibility as an educated member of society was eating away at that ambition. This, this guilt that maybe I wasn't doing all I could to help others. It's 1989, I'm in graduate school in New York City, Columbia University, Upper West Side. A phone call comes into the department from Fox News. The weather guy had read over the newswire that there was an explosion on the sun. And a guy said, you know, I get this is explosion on the sun. What could you tell us about it? I said, oh, it's just a blob of plasma, highly a ch a charged particles moving fast. He said, you mean Earth is okay? I said, Earth is fine. <laughs> he said, can you say that on the air? And I said, uh, okay. And he said, we'll send up a limo. Anyway, so we do the interview, call everybody. So I'm gonna be on TV, tune in. This is my first time on TV. So I'm home eating dinner and the interview comes on. There it is. And at the end, I had an epiphany. It was 1989. I had never before in my life. And I believe to this day that that was the first such occasion ever. But I had never before in my life seen an interview mm. with a black person on television for expertise that had nothing to do with being black. I'm talking about experts. An Bro intellectual. Intellectual. Object. I had never seen a black person here. The guy didn't ask me, well, how do black people feel about this plasma <laughs> coming from the sun? <laughs> I was telling him whether Earth would survive. And at that point, I realized that one of the last stereotypes that prevailed is that sort of black people are somehow dumb. And if you're prone to saying, oh, these black people, they don't work and they're too dumb, you're gonna have to remember that I just told you that Earth is safe from the plasma that came from the sun. And so you're gonna have to reconcile this. You're gonna have to be wondering, well, maybe this guy could have been one of those. Then I said to myself, it's not that the black community can't afford to have me do astrophysics, it can't afford to me to not do astrophysics. And at that point, I found myself standing outside the hole. I had climbed out just the act of observing that interview. And since then, there have been other interviews with uh, 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 intel intellectuals of minority groups that have nothing to do with their being a minority. But I think that might have been the first ever. Uh, have I, by whatever powers I have available to me, have I lessened the suffering of others? Have I enhanced the life of others? They're related. And I don't mean, have I devoted the whole day to doing that? Then I would be ignoring myself. But if there's some small gesture that I can do that can completely add value to someone's life, I'm gonna do it. My impact would be people learn from me in a way that they are empowered by what I taught them. So that when they think of what they learned from me, they no longer think of me. They think of their own base of understanding of how this world works. And so that I become irrelevant from that um, exercise. And because if people say, this is true because Tyson said so, then I fail. That's not how you teach someone. That's, that's teaching them by authority. I wanna, I, I wanna teach you how to think about the world and then you say, I have a new way to understand the world. And you just run off, don't, you don't even look back because a new level of hunger has descended upon you and methods and tools to feed that hunger are now accessible to you. So my impact would be that others are impacted and they don't even remember that I had something to do with it. For me, what I do for the public is prime, almost 80 plus percent of it is driven by duty, not by ambition. Because I can do something, and if I can do it better than others, and it's for a greater good in society, I would be irresponsible if I did not. Uh, I was in Central Park. We were just finishing one of the uh, Shakespeare in the Park performances, and it had rained a little earlier, so there were puddles in some of the walkways. I saw a woman walking with their kid, the kid has galoshes on and a raincoat on, and they're coming down the walkway. And there's this big, juicy, muddy puddle right there. And 
I said, please let the kid jump in the puddle. You know the kid wants to jump in the puddle. The kid is like three or four. You know the kid, and what, is the, what does the mother do? She pulls the kid around to prevent that from happening. That's an experiment in cratering. That's what ha craters happen that way. You splash the water, there's mud, it's fun. You get to see the cause and effect of a force, downward force operating on a, on a fluid. Gone. That was a bit of curiosity in that moment that was extinguished. So, with our kids, curiosity provided it does not kill them, if it meant we had extra work in front of us, I would do that extra work. So, your task is less to instill curiosity in your kids than it is to make sure you don't squash what's already there. In however they were raised, that they retained the curiosity of childhood into adulthood. School should, as a minimum, preserve that curiosity for you. And so you leave school and you say to yourself, I now know how to learn. I now have a curiosity of all things I have yet to be exposed to, and I will now become a lifelong learner. And what is a, an adult scientist but a, a kid who's never lost the curiosity? If you have a choice between doing what you're good at and doing what you love, you should do what you love, because eventually you'll get better at it for having loved it, and you may become better at what you love than anything you were previously good at that you didn't. I bet most of your people who've sat in this chair, it's not about what college they went to. It's about their own initiative, their own drive, their own ambitions, their own curiosity. You do not know in advance how you're gonna put all that together and make a life out of that. And it may be that you needed all those pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that you created for the very first time.